Okay, hello everyone. My name is Paul Nixon and I'm the so-called military expert at Find My Past. And I'm going to be talking to you this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're listening from, about the First World War and the records we have on Find My Past. So specifically, we're going to be looking at uh, the Somme in particular. Um, slaughter on the Somme, um, it's not an overstatement, it certainly was, um, particularly the first day. Um, 60,000 casualties, 20,000 killed nearly. Um, still the worst day in the history of the British Army. So, I mean, 30 years ago when I was researching men of the First World War, it was a devil's own job to get hold of the information. Uh, there was very little online. These days there's, there's so much more online and come, more coming on all the time. So what I've just done here is list all the key record sets that you should be looking at if you're interested in First World War servicemen. So from the top, medal index cards, medal rolls, that's campaign medal rolls. You also have um, gallantry awards like the Military Medal and the Distinguished Conduct Medal as well. Uh, Silver War Badge Roll, Service and Pension Records, Soldiers Died in the Great War, the Soldiers Effects Register, War Diaries, Regimental Records, Newspapers and Published Works. Um, all, the, all the ones in bold there um, you can find on Find My Past and I'll be going into those in some detail um, as we go on. So um, military records, so searching military records, if you go to Find My Past you can search on category. So you'll have the Military Armed Forces and Conflicts uh, category. And in this particular example I've got John Frederick Nixon who's my great uncle. And if I wanted to I could select a record set um, within the military collection. So where that arrow is pointing I could browse the record set or I could start, start typing something. So if I typed ARM for Army, all the record sets that we have with the word Army in would appear. So that's what happens when I type the, the browse. I get a, another box that appears and it shows me, in this case, um, the records beginning with A. So going from Abingdon uh, through to Anglo-Boer War, Army Deserters, etc. And if I saw something that I thought, OK, well, that's that looks as though it could be relevant to my great uncle, I would tick that and it would appear in my search uh, criteria. So here we can see um, that uh, John Frederick Nixon's name appears in uh, British Army service records, soldiers died in the Great War, and World War One British Army Medal index cards, and his name appears in the top three results there, because I was searching for John Frederick Nixon, and so the results have pulled up exactly John Frederick Nixon, and then second best John F. Nixon and then underneath that will be all the John Nixons. But those top three results are my great uncle. So another way of searching this um, military armed forces and conflicts collection is to just type in the name of the regiment and the soldier number or parts of the regimental name. So in this case if I was looking for East Surrey regiment I would type in EAS asterisk or wildcard, S-U-R, wildcard, and here for the number I've typed in 1-2, wildcard. So that's going to pull up all the names of men serving in the East Surrey Regiment with the number, regimental number beginning 1-2. Um, I think the wildcard searching is extremely useful and important to remember because had I just typed in there in the regiment field, East Surrey, then I probably would have got no results because the regiment has been indexed as East Surrey Regiment and it's looking for that complete match. Um, so if I type in East Surrey, I'm going to get East Surrey Regiment. Similarly, if I was looking for Essex Regiment, for instance, and I just typed in Essex, I would get nothing. If I typed in EWS asterisk, I get all results for Essex Regiment and Essex Yeomanry. So do remember that uh, wildcard and the asterisk is very important and it can be used in any field. So these are the results for the asterisk East Surrey and the number. So there's 1061 results altogether starting alphabetically with Abbott at the top and going right the way down to wherever uh, beginning Z presumably or Y. Um, but all of those men in there will have regimental numbers beginning 1-2 and you'll, and you'll find duplicate records there as well. So there'll be men who have records in um, service records and medal index cards and Surrey recruitment registers as well. So here we have um, a little discourse on the burnt documents, WO363. These are other ranks service papers which were held in a warehouse in 1940 in London's Docklands 
and were destroyed by a German incendiary bomb. Um, approximately two thirds of those were, of 6.5 million records were destroyed. And there's a good example of a burnt document on the right hand side. Pension records on the other hand were not stored in Docklands and were stored by the, with the Ministry of Pensions so they escaped the bombing and their records are pretty good. Um, so you're less likely to find attestation papers in these files, it's mostly pension documents but you will, will still find papers and this is a good example. So this is Charles Sabaran, his papers survive in 364 um, and also in 363. So 363, his service papers going from 1900, uh, he lost his leg on the first day of the Battle of Mons in August 1914 and so that's why he has papers in the pension um, Ministry of Pensions because he had a pension for life. Silver War Badge Roll. Um, important to note that um, the enlistment date is not necessarily the date that the man joined the regiment from which he was discharged. So in this case we can see the man was discharged from the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry from the regimental depot and he was discharged on the 24th of March 1919. He enlisted on the 6th of May 1913, but we shouldn't assume that he'd enlisted with the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry. He could have enlisted with another regiment on that date and later transferred to the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry. Um, his regimental number actually tells me that he's a Territorial Force man and it's a fairly low number, although it looks like a high number, it's a, it's a low number because they started at um, 200. 001 and he's 225 so he's the 225th man to receive a number when the territorial force was renumbered and so I think it's probably likely that he did enlist with that particular battalion um, from memory it would be the 4th battalion in May 1913 so we can see on there as well that he was uh, discharged as a result of wounds and the, the badge was issued in 1919 and he was 30 years old he also served overseas. So a lot of information contained within that record and uh, Find My Past has the transcription only for this particular series. It doesn't have the images. Soldiers died in the Great War. Um, here we are with my great uncle again, John Frederick Nixon, killed in action on the 3rd of October 1918. Uh, he was serving with the Rifle Brigade but attached to the 1st 8th London Regiment, the Post Office Rifles, um, at the time of his death. And Soldiers Died in the Great War is key because you get the birthplace, the residence, and the place of enlistment. So we can see he was born at Stratford, uh, resided at Stoke Newington, enlisted at Stoke Newington. And then you also have on Soldiers Died in the Great War supplementary notes as well. Now in this case there are no supplementary notes for John Frederick Nixon but some records um, do have notes which may include details of um, gallantry awards so it might say the man's awarded a military medal or it might say that he also served with another regiment or battalion and that's quite useful because often it will give you information about a unit served with before the man went overseas. If you go back to the medal index card and medal rolls you'll see on there um, that the, the details included on the card are the details of the regiment the man was serving with when he first set foot ashore in the theatre of war or you know, in the case of India, a country that, that, uh, that wasn't a theatre of war. But nevertheless, it's the information, the, it's the unit the man stepped ashore with. Um, he could have served with half a dozen units before travelling overseas and they won't appear on the medal index card or the medal rolls. Um, but that information does sometimes appear in the supplementary notes on this particular Soldiers Died in the Great War data set. So we're going to look at a case history now, William Crossley of the Manchester Regiment. Um, the article on the right is from the Manchester Evening News. Lance Corporal William Crossley served with the 17th Battalion Manchester Regiment. That's expressed in a number of different ways. So it's written as the 17th Manchesters, also known as the 2nd City Battalion or the 2nd Manchester Pals. And he died of wounds on the 4th of July 1916. We can see that um, on the right hand side it says he fell in action on, on July the 4th which implies he was killed in action but it's, um, it's used to cover death generally. Um, but we also see uh, that he was uh, where he was living, uh, where he was employed and his connection with the Church Lands Brigade as well. 
not to mention the photo as well which must be fantastic if people hadn't uh, seen him before had no idea what he looked like there it is in the newspaper so here we have uh, the section from uh, William Crossley's attestation paper and we can see on there that uh, this is a copy of his attestation paper as I, as I say um, when a man joined up he filled out the paper twice it was written written twice um, and you'll see on the service papers the word original and the word copy and uh, in this case this is a copy of the, the original service paper so the key information on here is his regimental number which is 8489 and the regiment he served with the, the Manchester regiment and the battalion he served with the 17th battalion and that's expressed as part of the number so you have 17 oblique 8489 and also on the right hand side you have 7th, 17th battalion Manchester regiment or 2nd city battalion Manchester regiment Inside we can see that he joined on the 3rd of September 1914 and he was a private appointed Lance Corporal on 23rd of October 1914. You then see that that appointment was confirmed in the battalion orders. Um, those battalion orders don't survive any, anymore but nevertheless it's written there and that he then died of wounds on the 4th of July 1916. Here again we have the same information on another version of his attestation paper albeit that information about the appointment in the battalion role doesn't appear here so um, but everything else is there it's the, it's the appointment from private to lance corporal and his death from wounds on the 4th of july 1916 this form is also a very useful form casualty form active service it's very commonly found in service records and pension records as well actually um, and it gives information that you won't find in attestation papers as we shall see in a minute but the, the top of the form is um, gives the basic information about the man uh, so his rank his his name uh, enlisted for general service and with both with this form and with the attestation paper um, just remember that these were filled in throughout the man's career so so the information would be entered when he joined and then as he was promoted or as he was transferred or posted from one battalion to another that information would be updated on the form so on some of these men's papers you'll see lots of crossings out um, so ranks changing regimental numbers changing regiments changing um, as the man moves throughout his career um, in, in William Crossley's case says that's not there because he's simply joined the 17th Battalion Manchester's um, and served with them and was killed with them uh, shortly afterwards so there's not a lot that needs to be added there he, he was just serving with that particular battalion and here's a detail again uh, very easy to read actually quite clear some common abbreviations you'll find on these forms um, detailing stated hospitals uh, you'll find CCS so the second column from the left 5 CCS is 5th Casualty Clearing Station IBD is uh, infantry based depot uh, so you've got OC 30 IBD which is the fourth entry down that's officer commanding 30th infantry based depot and that infantry based depot is at Etarp so he joined um, the infantry based depot at Etarp from 5GH from the 5th General Hospital GH is General Hospital um, FA is another abbreviation found on these forms it's not on this particular one but FA is field ambulance so CCS casualty clearing station FA field ambulance GH general hospital and you can see that he was admitted to 5th CCS with a scalded hand in January 16 um, he that was then transferred to the 5th general hospital stayed there before being uh, joint rejoining his battalion and then when he was wounded he was wounded uh, in the shoulder gunshot wound to his shoulder and he died um, in the fifth casualty clearing station the same casualty clearing station he'd been in six months earlier with his scalded hand and this is a letter from him um, explaining exactly how he came to have his scalded hand the army was very fastidious wanted to make sure that men weren't uh, self-inflicting um, wounds and this explanation was accepted it says in the records uh, that he'd thrown something in a fire which had flared up and burnt his hand um, and there it is signed by him lovely handwriting nice signature 
which again is uh, priceless if uh, your ancestor happens to be William Crossley. So this form also is quite commonly seen in the files of men who lost their lives, who were killed or died of wounds. Uh, Army form W05080, it gives information about next of kin. So you'll have parents, living, living um, uh, parents, um, living siblings, so that's full blood and half blood, all listed, names listed, ages list, listed and addresses listed as well. So for a family historian, it's absolutely gold dust, really. It's wonderful. So Fred, John Frederick Nixon, my great uncle, lists his four brothers and five sisters, all their ages, all their addresses. Uh, it's, very, it's a very full form. Unfortunately, he had to die for, for that information to be yielded. So back to William Crossley. He's here in this photo. This is a photo from the Manchester City Battalion's Book of Honour which was published, um, well, I'm not sure when it was published actually, but probably 1916, 1917. These photos date from the early days of the city battalions, so that the battalions had formed, and there the men are in, in their uniforms. Um, and In this particular photo, all the men have uniforms. Some of the photos, the men don't have uniforms. They're just wearing cloth caps and civilian clothes. But William Crossley is in here, and I've identified him. He's the man with a circle, of course. He's within that circle, and I identified him by comparing the photo with the photo on the Manchester, in the Manchester Evening News. So here's the photo of William Crossley in the Manchester Evening News on the left, and there's the photo of him on the right, and that's undoubtedly the same man. So from the Manchester City Battalion's book, we see information which isn't in the service records. So we've got the company he served with, the platoon he served with, and we also see the men he served alongside. So we don't know their names, but uh, we, we can see the men he served with. And the newspaper article, as we've seen, provides more context. And finally, for William Crossley, we get his um, description. So he's five foot nine inches tall, so quite tall actually for men of that uh, era. 131 pounds, dark complexion, blue eyes, black hair, Church of England, and had he had tattoos, scars, or other marks, those would be recorded there on the right hand side that that was um, and photographs weren't part of the attestation process it would have been an idea um, to include photographs but it certainly wasn't part of the process but if a man deserted those descriptions could be used to identify him so here's another man case history number two Harold Chadwick Meadowcroft 20th Manchester's um, his obituary was published in the Manchester Evening News, um, but no service record survives for him, so we need to construct a service history for him. So he appears in the Manchester City Battalion's Roll of Honour as well. We can see on the right-hand side that obituary that he was killed on the 1st of July, one of those um, 19,240 men who were killed. He was 27 years of age, uh, and was a prominent uh, footballer playing for Hayward, Glossop and Berry shot by a sniper when leading his section. You see that information you just wouldn't find in service records and it may not be true for that matter either. Um, but anyway, that's what they reported in the, in the newspaper. And here's Harold Meadowcroft in the photo with his colleagues in that particular platoon and company. Again, I've circled him there. So he's on the second row, fourth from left. Very distinctive features, sunken cheeks, um, almost the same expression on those photos, quite, quite an angular nose, and that's undoubtedly him. Here he is on the 1911 census. So you have Harold Meadowcroft signing the census return. So that's his handwriting we're seeing there. He's the second oldest child of Thomas and Jane Meadowcroft, living at um, Higher Crumpsall, Manchester, and working as a commercial traveller. His regimental number dates from my own research to the 17th or 18th of November 1914. He was an original member of the battalion and arrived in France on the 9th of November 1915. So you can follow him through the battalion war diary, although it's unlikely that he'll be mentioned by name. So I've mentioned newspapers a couple of times. Um, with both those men we've had photos and some newspapers published a lot of photos. And um, the newspapers are really a fantastic resource. We've got 14.6 million pages Digitised. These are papers as a result of our partnership with the British Library, it's the British Newspaper Archive. There's currently 651 titles online 
and of those, 149 cover the First World War, either in part or in full, and more papers being added every day. So, so there really is a very good and rich resource uh, within newspapers, and you can see on the right-hand side, um, this is a listing of men admitted to hospitals. So in these cases, SGH is Southern General Hospital, NGH is Northern, and WGH is Western General Hospital. You've got the names of the hospitals where they were admitted, their numbers, regimental numbers, and their names. And the regimental numbers are really key identifiers. So when you go to the newspaper collection, uh, you have an option to enter the man's name and then other information. I would always enter the man's name, the surname, and the regimental number. So I'm going to show you how that works in another case study now. Uh, this man is Corporal Frederick John Denton of the 9th Essex Regiment. He's a man I researched many years ago before all this information was online actually. Um, but um, as, as I say, it would have taken me a fraction of the time to research him now. Um, but anyway, that's him on the right hand side and in a group photo when he was recuperating in hospital. He's wearing his hospital blues in uh, in Sussex in 1916 and the photo on the right's a bit later on in the war. You can see his vertical wound stripe on his left sleeve and his corporal stripes of course as well. And on the photo on the left, you can't really see it too well uh, here, but he's wearing, there's a, there's a ribbon there, and that's a military medal ribbon, which was awarded to him at the hospital. So uh, in his case, what I did was type in Denton in the surname field and his regimental number 12517 in the other information section. Hit the search button, and it came up with a number of results across the decades. I know that I was only looking for him for the First World War, so I selected... Uh, 1900 to 1919 or the, or the relevant decade and came up with I think half a dozen results of, of some of which I'm showing here and I can straight away rule out the, the result from the Nottingham Evening Post which is the third one down and the one beneath that as well which is the Manchester Courier because those are not that particular man but the others are so we can see the top one mentioned in dispatches so as well as being awarded the military medal he was also mentioned in dispatches um, the second entry is also concerning his mention in dispatches and the final entry there you can see is uh, an Essex casualty reported on 11th of August 1916 in the Chelmsford Chronicle. Well Denton was wounded on the 3rd of July 1916 on the Somme and his brother was killed next to him on the same day. Um, his brother was 17 years old, Victor Denton, and he has no known grave and is on the memorial at Tiepfal. But very easy again just to find these results here um, on Find My Past and as I say there's more pages being entered all the time more, more being digitized and published on Find My Past so do keep looking at that resource. So further reading uh, for the Somme uh, where, where to start really I've just keyed in some uh, a few titles that I would recommend personally First Day on the Somme by Martin Middlebrook and the third one down Somme by Lynn MacDonald both give great accounts um, in the soldier's own words. First day of the Somme by Cooksey and Moorland uh, on the second entry down is a travel guide so if you're planning a visit to the Somme either by car or on foot then that's a, a very good very well written guide. Slaughter on the Somme and Tracing British Battalions on the Somme both um, take as their starting point the diaries the war diaries for all the regiments and the battalions that served um, on the Somme uh, on the 1st of July in the case of John Greehan and Martin Mace and in the case of Ray Westlake from July to November 1916. So so the 1st of July volume is very detailed, it's transcriptions from the war diaries so it save you going to look at the war diaries and plus it has notes, it's, it's, very, it's a quick and easy way of looking at what happened on the 1st of July. Tracing British Battalions on the Somme by Ray Westlake uh, is um, uh, is a summary of what uh, what the battalions were doing during that period in 1916, um, and it's it's very very readable. Ray, Ray Westlake is a very uh, authoritative um, and respected historian. Talking of which, so is Paul Reed. Walking the Somme is a very is a very good book. I should be taking that with me when I go to the Somme shortly. It's um, the circular guides, circular walks on the Somme, so you can park your car in one place, do the walk, and come back to your car as well. Um, recommended. So, so all of those books uh, have their have their benefits. Um, the image on the right is the Tiepval Memorial, listing the names of over seventy thousand missing on the Somme. 
And finally, last slide for me for now. Uh, this is these are two books on the British Army, which I would recommend. Um, the, the Somme Battle uh, is perhaps best known, apart from the numbers of men killed, um, for the fact that the PALS battalions um, met their Armageddon there, to use another cliche, uh, on the 1st of July. Um, but there were but the men who fought on the Somme and died on the Somme were far from all being volunteers in Kitchener's army. There were plenty of regulars as well. And these two books both deal with the regular army, the setup of the army, the way it was organised, um, and the way it the way it ran and functioned. Both um, have contributions from James Moncrief, Moncrief Grierson, who authored *Scarlet and Khaki*, um, as it was as the reprint is called. Um, on his own. Uh, he's a contributor to the Army Book for the British Empire, which was published in 1893. Scarlet into Khaki was published in uh, 1899, so there's a few years between them, but they're both extremely readable and extremely valuable reference resources, and I've, I use them all the time. In fact, I've got Scarlet into Khaki in my bag at the moment, which I'm rereading for the umpteenth time. So I, I heartily recommend both of those books, and I thank you all for listening to this uh, webinar, and I hope it's been